However unfashionable it may appear, I am actually convinced that there really are good reasons to believe that God exists. And let me just sketch tonight briefly some of those reasons. Number one, God is the best explanation of the origin of the universe. Number two, God is the best explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. Three, God is the best explanation of objective moral values in the world. Number four, the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus imply God's existence. Finally, number five, God can be immediately known and experienced. On the other hand, I think we've got five good reasons, all of which point to the existence of a transcendent creator and designer of the universe who is the locus of absolute value, who has revealed himself in Jesus of Nazareth, and who can be personally known and experienced. In fact, I would venture to say that Christianity as a worldview stands intellectually head and shoulders above any other ism or philosophy of life that you might care to enunciate. And for that reason, I find myself enthusiastically a Christian theist. Reasonable Faith features the work of philosopher and theologian Dr. William Lane Craig. He is widely regarded as one of the greatest defenders of the Christian faith of our time. For over 30 years, he has been researching, writing, and debating the world's top atheists, agnostics, and skeptics in defense of Christianity. The uh, one Christian apologist who seems to put the fear of God into many of my fellow atheists. Our goal as Christians is not to win arguments, it's to win people. And we try to persuade them by giving them good reasons for belief. And that means that the training of the mind is an integral and vital part of Christian discipleship. As Anthony Kenny of Oxford University, he writes, a proponent of the Big Bang Theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But surely that doesn't make sense. Out of nothing, nothing comes. So why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? Where did it come from? There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. I thought that the first premise that whatever begins to exist has a cause was virtually indisputable. Yeah. Suppose that something could come into existence from nothing. If that were the case, then it's inexplicable. Why just anything and everything doesn't pop into being out of nothing. But no one here tonight is worried that while you're listening to this debate, a horse may have popped into being uncaused out of nothing in your living room and is there defiling the carpet right now as we speak. Well, it, it, it's worse than magic yeah. when you think about it. It really is. In, in magic, when the magician pulls a rabbit out of the hat, at least you've got the magician. <laughs> right? But on, on atheism, the universe just popped into being uncaused out of absolutely nothing. So if you do not believe in magic... You should resist any kind of attempt to deny the argument by rejecting the first premise, because then you're believing something worse than magic. Does that imply a god? It does if the first premise is true, that whatever begins to exist has a cause. It logically follows. Yeah, that but, therefore, doesn't, but, but the cause hasn't got to be God. Well, remember I gave a, a, an argument for thinking that this cause is timeless, yes, spaceless, immaterial, uh, enormously powerful, and personal. Now, as the cause of space and time, this being must be an uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial being of unfathomable power. Moreover, it must be personal as well. Why? Because the cause must be beyond space and time. Therefore, it cannot be physical or material. Now, there are only two kinds of things that fit that description. Either an abstract object, like numbers, or else a personal mind. But abstract objects can't cause anything. Therefore, it follows that the cause of the universe is a transcendent, intelligent mind. Secondly, how else could a timeless cause give rise to a temporal effect like the universe? 
If the cause were an impersonal set of necessary and sufficient conditions, then the cause could never exist without its effect. If the cause were permanently present, then the effect would be permanently present as well. The only way for the cause to be timeless and the effect to begin in time is for the cause to be a personal agent who freely chooses to create an event in time without any antecedent determining conditions. I think it's a computer. Well, that wouldn't, uh, computers are designed by people. I no, mean, no, this is a self-designing computer. Uh -huh. Timeless. Timeless. Well, that's a contradiction in terms. Why is it time? What's contradictory about it? A, a computer has to function, it takes Oh, time. no, this is a special computer. <laughs> yeah, but it has to be logically coherent. Oh, it's logically coherent? Yes, you have to be logically coherent. Oh, no, coherent. this and, computer and besides, is amazing. No, it, it, besides, it, it would have to be, as I said, a personal being. No. In, a computer is a physical Not this computer. Object. Oh, well, then, no. Okay, see, what you're doing is you're actually, what you're calling a computer is really God. A, a, a non-physical, <laughs> non... It's just, it's just another word if you rob it of all the attributes that make it a computer. If it is the case that you can't prove that God does not exist, then you shouldn't be a naturalist. You should be some sort of agnostic or something, but you shouldn't say th go around saying things like, nature is all there is. There is nothing beyond matter and energy. There is no supernatural reality, because those claims exceed what you yourself say you can prove. Stood Mr. Hitchens' last speech, he would agree with that first statement, that there is no good argument that atheism is true. He says, I simply don't have any positive reason to believe in God, but he doesn't really give an argument against God's existence. Indeed, he seems to suggest that's impossible. But notice that doesn't prove atheism. That just leaves you with agnosticism, namely, you don't know if there's a God or not. So at best, you're left merely with agnosticism. To see how my reasoning process works, let me try an analogy. Suppose you have a large sum of money you wish to invest, and I'm a broker, and I'm telling you the stock market's going up and up and up and up and up. And you say to me, well, now look, I'm pretty happy with my bank uh, checking account. My money's really safe. Uh, give me several positive good reasons for investing it in the stock market. And I proceed to give you one after another really weak in your judgment argument. And after you get past the third or fourth one, you stop me and you say, no, I'm not going to additionally try to put my money in the stock market. I don't want my money there. You haven't given me enough good reasons. Okay, now, so the naturalist is somebody who no, wait, wait, retains... Look. This exactly illustrates my point. That person has not given you reasons to believe the stock market is going up. But that doesn't allow you any way logically to conclude that therefore the stock market isn't going to go up or that it's going to go down. You, you simply have to withhold right. judgment. You see, I, it seems to me your, uh, your, your reasoning here is, is logically invalid. On the atheistic view, certain actions such as rape, and incest may not be biologically and socially advantageous and so in the course of human development have become taboo that is socially unacceptable behavior but that does absolutely nothing to prove that such acts are really wrong such behavior goes on all the time in the animal kingdom on the atheistic view the rapist who chooses to flout the herd morality is doing nothing more serious than acting unfashionably. The moral equivalent, if you will, of Lady Gaga. Repeat the first part of the question again, because I, I disagreed with what you said there. It is impossible to oh, prove yeah, that's right. the non- It's impos impossible to prove something does not exist. That's, that's silly. Of course you can prove something does not exist. Uh, we can prove, for example, that there are no living Tyrannosaurus Rex on the face of the earth. We can prove that there are no Muslims of the United States Senate. Uh, or, as Dr. Shook says, if you can show that something is a self-contradiction, uh, he's in the house. Yeah. Uh, um, you can show that something is self-contradictory. So there are no married bachelors. So it's, it, this is an atheist line that you hear on a popular level all the time, but that sophisticated atheists don't take because it is easy to prove that things don't exist. This has been pointed out by Frank uh, Tipler and John Barrow in their book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle. They list 10 steps in the course of human evolution, each of which 
each of which is so improbable that before it would have occurred by chance alone, the sun would have ceased to be a main sequence star and incinerated the Earth. And they calculate the probability of the evolution of the human genome between four to the negative 180th power to the 110,000th power and four to the negative 360th power to the 110,000th power. So if evolution did occur, it would literally be a miracle and therefore evidence for the existence of God. If he had succeeded in demolishing your arguments, would your faith have remained intact? Yes, uh, both because my faith is not ultimately based on arguments, but also because I've got other arguments. <laughs> Auger characterized my debate with the British atheist Lewis Wolpert at Central Hall, Westminster, London, in the following way. Wolpert, there's no evidence that God exists. Craig. There is evidence that God exists, and here it is. Wolpert, there's no evidence that God exists. Craig, there is evidence that God exists, and here it is. Wolpert, there's no evidence that God exists. Well, I'm afraid that that characterization isn't very far from the truth. However unfashionable it may appear, I am actually convinced that there really are good reasons to believe that God exists. And let me just sketch tonight briefly some of those reasons. Number one, God is the best explanation of the origin of the universe. Number two, God is the best explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. Three. God is the best explanation of objective moral values in the world. Number four, the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus imply God's existence. Finally, number five, God can be immediately known and experienced. There's no evidence that God exists. There is zero evidence for the existence of God. On the other hand, I think we've got five good reasons, all of which point to the existence of a transcendent creator and designer of the universe who is the locus of absolute value, who has revealed himself in Jesus of Nazareth, and who can be personally known and experienced. My argument against God's existence doesn't depend upon genes. It's the absence of evidence. And There's no evidence that God exists. In fact, I would venture to say that Christianity as a worldview stands intellectually head and shoulders above any other ism or philosophy of life that you might care to enunciate. And for that reason, I find myself enthusiastically a Christian theist. There's not the slightest indication of evidence of the kind that we would use in science in our day-to-day -day lives for the existence of this supernatural being again. There's no evidence that God exists. By the way, I uh, hear that the word is out on campus that uh, between the two of us, Austin Dacey is hotter. Um, <laughs> now that may be the case, but uh, <laughs> all I can say is this, I'll bet you my wife is hotter. <laughs> I want to invite Mr. Hitchens to think about becoming a Christian tonight. Uh, all of honestly, it, honestly, if, if he is a man of goodwill who will follow the evidence where it leads, all of the evidence tonight has been on one side of the scale. And he wants to affirm objective moral values, so why not adopt theism? Professor Atkins, uh, would you like to, to comment on what you think about philosophy trying to use um, science to do philosophy, is, is that a mistake to try and answer questions in that, oh, that method that sort yeah. of... Philosophy is a complete lining. waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> and what Professor Atkins says in his um, book uh, on being is that in fact the universe never really began to exist because nothing exists. He says the positive and negative energy in the universe balance each other out and thus on balance there is zero energy and therefore really nothing exists. 
Not you, not me, not Professor Atkins. There is nothing here. I will concede that. But it's an extremely interesting form of nothing. There was nothing originally. There is nothing here now. But it's through whatever event took place at the inception of the universe, it became an interesting form of nothing. If Professor Atkins is right, then nobody has really offered this objection, uh, right? Because nobody exists. So why should I bother refuting it if the objection doesn't even exist and nobody has ever raised it? So I think the conclusion is, is clearly absurd. Tex, you're a dirty, cheating skunk. Every time you deal, you get four aces. Egad, Jones. Look how the processes of metamorphosis and sedimentation have formed these uncanny objects. I would like to come back to an earlier point, if Please. I may, too, and that is the notion that atheists are somehow the intelligentsia among us and so forth. I think this is just completely false. The spate of new books published by the new atheists like Harris and Hitchens and Dawkins and so forth are not sophisticated books intellectually. These are, for the most part, angry, uh, bitter diatribes against religion. And while someone like Dawkins may be a good scientist in his field, when he begins to talk about philosophy and theology, he is merely a layman. And The God Delusion is a very unsophisticated book intellectually. As a philosopher, I, I was just appalled at the arguments he gives in that book. Uh, it is an embarrassment, really, I think. Well, I, I can agree, and I, I, I suspect uh, Michael may, may as well. That I think he would, too. It, it, the re, if you look at the reviews, uh, this man is, is respected in his field. Yes. But this book, if you look at the reviews, they're, they're quite damning. I used to work with Chris Hitchens. He's a bright guy. He's a fun guy. This is not a, a profound book. It, it's a fun book in many ways. So mm. I think most people would agree that the three you mentioned in particular, Dawkins, Harris, and Hitchens, what they've written is not first-class scholarship. However, there are first-class scholars and genuine intellectuals who do certainly. not believe at, at all in Certainly. God. Certainly there are, Michael. But there has also been, especially over the last 50 years, since the late 1960s, a, a literal revolution in my discipline, philosophy, uh, in the Anglo-American world, which has brought about a renaissance of Christian philosophy such that some of our finest philosophers at our most prestigious universities are now outspoken Bible-believing okay. Christians. Sir? I'm sorry. Where is this uh, philosophical revolution taking place? I'm In the Anglo-American realm. Um, the ones dominated by uh, assume, assumed atheists like people like Iyer, um, people like Bertrand Russell, uh, who really dominate? Like, well, the, I'm sorry, I just never have what heard was the first this. Thing you said? I think you meant air. Oh, from AJ yeah. Air. A AJ but, Air. But that's yeah. a, that's a bygone generation, Michael. I'm talking about or today. About, okay, let's talk about people from today, like Quine. Right? He's who, dead too. Well, he died only a couple of years. Like, so did Freddie Air, but I mean, <laughs> well, let, no, let's well, talk AJ about Air. let's so, name names. People like Richard Swinburne. Uh, at Oxford University, uh, Robert and Marilyn Adams at Oxford, Brian Leftow at Oxford, uh, people like Alvin Planning at University of Notre Dame, Peter Van Inwagen, uh, Dallas Willard, Eleanor Stump. I mean, I could go on and on naming names at top universities in America and England who are outspoken Christians, such that the face of my discipline compared to the 1930s and 40s, when Russell and Ayer were dominant, has been utterly transformed. But uh, do you deny that science cannot account for everything? Yes, I do deny that science So what can't it account for? Well, I, had you brought that up in the debate, I had a number of examples that I was going to give. Uh, I think there are a good number of things that cannot be scientifically proven, but that we're all rational to accept. Let, so, me, list, let me list five. Logical and mathematical truths cannot be proven by science. Science presupposes logic and math, so that to try to prove them by science would be arguing in a circle. Uh, metaphysical truths, like there are other minds other than my own, or that the external world is real, or that the past was not created five minutes ago with an appearance of age, are rational beliefs that cannot be scientifically proven. Ethical beliefs about statements of value uh, are not accessible by the scientific method. You can't show by science whether the Nazi scientists in the camps did anything evil as opposed to the scientists in Western democracies. Aesthetic judgments, number four, cannot be accessed by the scientific method because the beautiful, like the good, 
cannot be scientifically proven. And finally, most remarkably, would be science itself. Science cannot be justified by the scientific method. Science is permeated with um, unprovable assumptions. For example, in the special theory of relativity, the whole theory hinges on the assumption that the speed of light is constant in a one-way direction between any two points A and B. But that strictly cannot be proven. We simply have to assume that in order to hold to the theory. But you're missing the whole... So put you... that in your pipe and smoke it. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> okay. So okay. We are, uh, none of these beliefs can be scientifically proven, and yet they are accepted by all of us, and we're right. Uh, there's an issue that I perceive as severely problematic by any theist point uh, that involves the fact that every single person in this room, and in fact every single person on this planet, is an atheist many, 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 many times over in regards to the pantheon of gods that have come before. And the reality is, is that the people that believed in these gods um, believed it with every bit of fervency that anybody in here might believe in, in you know, the Abrahamic God. and there's a problem there because none of those gods are any less likely quite frankly none of them are any less rational they're all irrational the fact of the matter is the possibility of Zeus existing is no less likely than the possibility of Yahweh and I think it's a serious problem that I think has to be addressed and it never has been to my liking ever mm -hmm. it's easy to address um, definition of atheism remember I'm going to read again from the encyclopedia of philosophy According to the most usual definition, an atheist is a person who maintains that there is no God. That is, that the sentence God exists expresses a false proposition. Therefore, in no sense I'm, am I an atheist. Uh, just because I deny the existence of uh, Odin and Thor and Zeus and Hermes doesn't make me an atheist because to be an atheist you need to believe the proposition there is no God. And I semantics. believe there is a I'm God. sorry, but that's semantics. Excuse me? That's semantics. No, You're sir, arguing it's semantics. not. This, is a, this means that you believe a universally quantified statement. There is no such being as God. And, and uh, I don't believe that because I do believe that there is a God. So, so you use a word other than atheist, it still comes to the same question. thing. No, what you, you have been led astray by uh, a common sort of internet infidel talking point that is given to atheists to use against theists to make it seem like the atheist claim is less radical, that everybody is an atheist about other gods. And that's simply not true because to be an atheist you have to believe there is no god at all. And I don't believe that, so in no sense am I an atheist. Now, you've simply asserted that uh, belief in Odin and Thor and Zeus and so forth is no more rational or irrational than belief in uh, classical theism. Uh, that's what this whole debate, in a sense, has been about. And, uh, and to show that, you would have to refute all of my arguments. Um, and you're welcome to, to do that. Uh, I think these arguments are, are sound arguments, and they're incompatible with the existence of uh, these deities that you mentioned. So I, I'm willing to stand on the evidence that I've presented. The why question is just a silly question. We humans are obsessed with purpose. It seems perfectly natural when we're presented with an object to say, what's it for? It starts in childhood. Uh, the psychologist Deborah Kellerman has investigated this very interestingly with children, offering them a question like, why do you think these rocks are pointy? Is it because of some uh, geological explanation, geological cause, or is it so that animals could scratch on them when they get itchy? And below a certain age, I think it's about six, most children answer with the teleological answer, answer with the, the purpose question. Yes, they're pointy so that animals can scratch on them when they get itchy. Children then mostly grow out of that purposive way of looking at the world, but not apparently everybody. I think the most reprehensible position represented in tonight's debate is Richard Dawkins' claim that why questions are just silly. These are the deepest existential questions that human beings can ask and refuse 
to refuse to ask such why questions is to reduce human beings to mere animals, which is, of course, exactly what Professor Dawkins believes. We're just animated chunks of matter in motion. Uh, love, questions of meaning, and so forth, they're all ultimately just spin-offs of the blind bioevolutionary process. But if God exists, then clearly these are meaningful questions. These are vital questions for the nature of human existence and destiny. The tragedy would be that if God does exist and you miss his purpose for your life because you think these are silly questions and therefore don't need to think about them would be the ultimate tragedy. Richard Dawkins, please. I think the whole case the other side is putting really comes down to an emotional case rather than a rational one. William Lane Craig seemed to think that it would be so intolerable, so disagreeable that uh, we are doomed to death, that the universe is doomed to death. Somehow playing on the heartstrings, playing on the emotions, it's not nice to think that we're all going to die. It's not nice to think that the universe is going to die a heat death and uh, that everything is going to come to an end. It's not nice to think that everything is meaningless. And therefore, somehow, we, that must prove that there is purpose in the universe, that there is some sort of top-down supervising God. There has been a major shift in the last two speeches in this debate. Did you see what it was? We've argued tonight, first of all, that if God does not exist, then the universe has no purpose. Our atheist colleagues admit that. But now what they've been claiming is, but look, we can construct a purpose for our lives, in Richard Dawkins' words, or in Michael Shermer's words, we can uh, develop ways to make us feel better, feeling like we have a purpose. Now, you see, this just is to say that we can pretend that the universe exists for some purpose. And this is just make-believe. This is the subjective illusion of purpose. But there is on this view no objective purpose for the universe. And we, of course, would never deny that you can't develop subjective purposes for your life. The point is on atheism, they're all illusory. And that's why I agree with Richard Dawkins when he said at bottom, this is an emotional question rather than a rational one. I wish I had had the courage to say that. I'm convinced that people adopt atheism, at least tonight, primarily for emotional rather than rational purposes. The rational arguments tonight all have supported theism. But you cannot live as though your life were purposeless and meaningless. And therefore, you adopt subjective illusions of purpose to make your life livable. And that's why I think atheism is not only irrational, it is profoundly unlivable. You cannot live consistently and purposefully within the context of an atheistic worldview. He claims that the property of being good is identical with the property of creaturely flourishing. And he's not offered any defense of this radical identity claim. In fact, I think we have a knockdown argument against it. Now, bear with me here. This is a little technical. On the next to last page of his book, Dr. Harris makes the telling admission that if uh, people like rapists, liars, and thieves could be just as happy as good people, then his moral landscape would no longer be a moral landscape. Rather, it would just be a continuum of well-being whose peaks are occupied by good and bad people or evil people alike. Now, what's interesting about this is that earlier in the book, Dr. Harris explained that about three million Americans are psychopathic. That is to say, they don't care about the mental states of others. They enjoy inflicting uh, pain on other people. But that implies that there's a possible world, which we can conceive, in which the continuum of human well-being is not a moral landscape. The peaks of well-being could be occupied by evil people. But that entails that in the actual world, the continuum of well-being and the moral landscape are not identical either. For identity is a necessary relation. There is no possible world in which some entity A is not identical to A. So if there's any possible world in which A is not identical to B, then it follows that A is not in fact identical to B. 
Now, since it's possible that human well-being and moral goodness are not identical, it follows necessarily that human well-being and goodness are not the same as Dr. Harris has asserted in his book. Now, it's not often in philosophy that you get a knockdown argument against a position, but I think we've got one here uh, by granting that it's possible that the continuum of well-being is not identical to the moral landscape, Dr. Harris's view becomes logically incoherent. If there's anybody watching or listening to the debate tonight who hasn't found God in a personal experiential way, then I want to invite you as well to think about becoming a Christian. I became a Christian as a junior in high school, and it changed my entire life. And I believe that if you'll look into it honestly with an open mind and an open heart, that it can change your life as well.